Wait, what? Guys, what just happened? What the? I don't know, but this looks like Burk from Out Train Your Dragon. As far as I know, we were looking at this incredibly realistic little viking, and suddenly, here we are. Yeah, but what do we do now? Guys, guys, there you are. Have we been introduced? I've been searching everywhere for you. We have to finish the dragon classification this afternoon. Okay, do you at least have a partial genotyping of the species? What? what? Wait, 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 is that the thing where you go inside the dragon and try to classify it based on what you see inside? Seriously? Well, it's not like we had anything else to do. Okay, I don't think we have anything better to do, so time to classify dragons. Guys, there is no point doing that. Look, it has already been done. Yeah, but no. This classification seems to be arbitrary, and there is neither information about sources, nor about the method used to make this. Moreover, they are about dragons from different fictions, and what we are doing here is focused on the How to Train Your Dragon universe. For those unaware of this, the universe of How to Train Your Dragon is pretty similar to the real world, except that there is different sort of dragons roaming around. The movies, the series and the video games takes place in an archipelago under what seems to be an arctic climate. More precisely, the whole story occurs on Burke Island, which is, according to Harold, the main character, located 12 days north of Hopeless and a few degrees south of freezing to death. It's located solidly on the meridian of misery. On this island live an extremely caricatural group of Vikings who are frequently attacked by one or even groups of dragons. To survive, these Vikings develop different types of defenses and also rely on a reliable knowledge of the different types of dragons and how to fight them. Borg the Bold's classifications. This classification is composed of seven classes named after the dragons that they are composed of. The titles are big dragons living either in or close to the sea. They can't spit fire. The strokers are compulsive fire throwers, and weirdly enough, they tend to set themselves on fire. The boulders have the surprising capacity of eating rocks and they are known to have particularly small wings when compared to their body size. The trackers are somehow the rangers of dragons. They have an extremely efficient sense of taste and smell, which grant them with the ability of tracking their prey. Sharps. They are very sharp and spiky parts all over the body. The mystery of the rest. It's the catch-all classes, we don't know a lot about them because of their behavior. They are vicious and tend to stay sneaky. Some of them have been seen taking bones of dead dragons to build an armor. Finally, the classiest class, the strike class. You're allowed to stun Michel to death for this joke, even though it was written by me. These dragons are the most intelligent, the fastest, and their jaws are scary as fuck. And since it's not enough, they are known for their accurate, precise, powerful and explosive attacks. This classification might be very useful when you have to fight dragons on a day-to-day -day basis, even though we'll see it sometimes like precision. But apart from fighting, it's kinda useless, or should I say informationless. So since we have time to lose, we're going to build a brand new classification by ourselves. First, let's see what is a phylogenetic tree. I am pretty sure you have already seen this kind of tree. They can look like this, or this, or this. But for phylogenetic trees 101, we will take a simpler example. These are leaves. It's what we want to classify. They can either be species, subspecies, classes, kinds, or even galaxies. And since we are lowbrow people, we're going to use bathroom equipment for this first example. The tree presented here is not based on real data and have been realized on an arbitrary basis during the writing of this script. The tree represents the resemblance between the equipments. The more you have to go back in the tree to link two equipments, the less those equipments will be like each other. Let's take an example. Here, the edgy tap is more like the round tap than it is like the shower. This is because you have to go further in the tree to link the edgy tap and the shower than you have to do to link the two taps. In the same way, the taps and the shower are more like each other than they are like a toilet. This is what we call a monophyletic group. 
which means that everything in this group is closer from each other than it is from anything outside the group. It's a keyword, so I'll insist. This is a monophyletic group. This too. This is not. To have a monophyletic group, chimpanzees and gorillas should be inside the group, because humans are closer from chimpanzees and gorillas than they are from gibbons, not monophyletic. Yes? No. In phylogeny, we try to create groups, and we want those groups to be monophyletic. That's why we sometimes say that fishes does not exist, they are not a monophyletic group. Did you add it enough? Monophyletic. Now, let me make one thing clear. On this tree, the latrine is just beside the shower. That does not mean that they are close. The shower is still closer from the curved tap. You only need to go this far in the tree to link the shower and the curved tap, when you'll have to go this far for the shower and the latrine. So, your tree, it's just something to see things clearer? Not exactly. There is a part of the tree I did not talk about. The notes. Here. Yeah, lines crossing. Except that each time the line crosses, there is a common ancestor. A common ancestor is a theoretical species. We call it a common ancestor since it is the ancestor of the world group it is linked to. And it is theoretical as we will never place a species on a note, even if it is extinct. This is because we can't know if the species we found is or is not the actual ancestor of another species. We can only assess how much they are like each other. That's why latrines are placed just next to our contemporary toilets. If we use the right method, there is another cool thing about trees. Reconstructing the history of characters. From the characteristics of the group we classified, we can estimate when each character appeared. And when I say when they appeared, it does not necessarily mean that we can know the precise date. We will only be able to say after this or before that. Let's apply this to our bus group. The character Metallic is present in all of this group, but not in this one. It must have appeared here. Now let's do the same with the character using water. This character is present in all of this group and in a part of this one. Here we have two possibilities. First, the character might have appeared early, here or earlier, at a time that is not in our tree. This would mean that a reversion happened here. We talk about a reversion since the character got back to its ancestral state. Here, not using water. The other possibility is to have two independent apparitions, in two different branches of the tree, here and here. This often happens when two different life forms develop the same adaptation to a same environment. We can see this for the fins of a tuna and a dolphin. They serve the same function, but evolved separately. Cool, now we know how to read a tree, but right now we don't have any. Cool down, first we need to set a few working bases. First, we will use as trusted sources by order of importance the films, the series, the games, and the website How to Train Your Dragon Wiki, which centralizes all of the previous ones. We will consider that Harold and Fishleg is right when they say, Webbing? Of course, you can't fly, so you needed a way to island hop. You adapted, evolved. Fine, actual proof of dragon evolution. Well, not so strong as evidence. But still, the universe of how to train your dragon seems pretty similar to ours, so saying that dragons evolve is not such a huge assumption. There are two big ways to make a tree. The phonetic method and the cladistic method. Mm, bless you? I'll keep the phonetic method for another video. Right now, let's focus on the cladistic method. It is the most precise and allows to reconstruct the history of characters. But as we will see, it's really time consuming. When we use it, we try to recreate the best tree in regard of the family ties of the groups we want to classify. First, we need to gather some information to make our tree own. Today, most scientists use genetics to get it, but we don't really have access to dragon's genetic information. So we'll have to fall back to physiologic and behavioral cues. And we put that in a table. A huge table. 54 species for 104 characters. We'll take into account two types of traits. Those which can be considered as binary, for example, a dragon can either spit fire or not. Aha, and what about chronic dragons? Nope. Then there are multi-state traits, for example, the number of horns. All this data looks like a bunch of numbers in a huge table. And this table has to be transformed into a tree. 
To do so, the best way we know is creating all possible trees and find out which one is the most probable. Yes, but now we have 54 species of dragon to classify. We will have more trees than the Amazonian forest. Far more than the Amazonian forest. This represents a bit less than 3 times 10 to the power of 84 possible trees, or 3 with 84 zeros after it. For the scale, we estimate the number of atoms in the universe to only 10 at the power of 80. So the cladistic method is precise and a very good tool to reconstruct the history of traits. But it takes nearly as long as what it took to evolve from one cell to what we are today. Okay, so except if we can get some calculator from Nas- Wait, is there a NASA in this world? Anyway, we can't compute all the trees as you said, so how do you want to do it? Well, there is a way. We are going to create a tree, randomly, and then make a few changes. If the newly created tree is better than the old one, we keep it. And if it's not, we try another modification. And so on. But then, we arrive on another difficulty of the cladistic method. We obtain many equally probable trees. So what we do is that we take all of those trees and use them to create one single consensus tree. There are many methods to do this. But here, we will keep the subgroups only if they were present in 90% of the best trees. And here is our tree. Well, 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 you might want to develop a bit more. On this tree, we will create 10 groups. Don't ask me why, it's arbitrary. Anyway, in those 10 groups, there are 3 that are especially big. Right now, I'll name 2 of them. Most of the group to the right, and their common ancestor, have a conic muzzle. So from the Latin words for muzzle and con, I'll call this group conaribus. For the group in the middle, we see that all of the species breathe things, not necessarily fire, but things, continuously, except for those two ones, who we decided to piss us off by reversing this character. So we will call this group the Flamidnis. Michel, anything else? The dragons classified as titles by Borg the Bold seems concentrated in the Conaribus group, especially here. Yep, and if we look at the character Breathfire, we see that it disappeared right here. That's a reversion. If we go a little bit deeper, we see that only one of these dragons is not known as a good swimmer. So I propose to redefine the tidal class to make it fit this group. The strokers are pretty dense here. You know, the ones that have this nasty habit to set themselves on fire. Well, about setting themselves on fire, only 3 out of 10 do it. And for one of them, it's only partial ignition. Now, we see that one of the ancestral traits of this group is to breathe fire. Yeah, that's not exactly common in those dragons. So I enlarge the stroker group to make it fit this one. The last thing is that the boulders are nearly exclusively regrouped here. So I guess we could call this new group the boulders. Especially since the most outstanding character of this group is to have wings shorter than their body, one of the characters defining boulders in Boxy Bolt's classification. For the four other classes, I got nothing. Well, those classes are defined either by pretty vague criterion that overlapped with other groups, or even by characters present in all groups, like having spiky parts for the sharp group. Not so defining when nearly all dragons have spikes on their back. To summarize, we got new groups. Boulders, Tidals and Strokers are more or less fitting with the old groups with the same names. We also have a big old new group called Conarebus and a few other new groups. Roshivals are able to eat rocks, and Spinocodus have tons of spines around their tail. We call this group Thumb Pose, because they have an opposable finger, just like our thumb. And this one is the Biscorny group, those who have two arms right here. Yay, we got our groups. Can we go home now? Not so fast. There is one last thing I want to talk about. Now that we have our groups, we can extrapolate the appearance of common ancestors. Of course, we can do this easily only for the characters we use to make our tree. For neck, tail, and leg lengths, or for the color, I had to define it arbitrarily. One small detail. The drawing has been made by Artemis. You can make fun of it. Hey, he told me to say it. So here is how the common ancestor of all dragons we studied should look like. Since it is the common ancestor of all our species, we place it at the root of the tree, here. Then we have the common ancestor of Conaribus. We see the appearance of this membrane, linking spines. It could serve for regulation of the dragon's internal temperature. The common ancestor of Flumignis, him, develop a crest. 
It might be used as a defense from predators or in a fight with a dragon of the same species. It also loses front legs and so long becomes biped. Finally, the ancestor of boulders should be more or less like this. The main change we see is the reduced size of the wings. We know for a fact that those wings does not imply a lower than average flying capacity. It might allow them to fly more easily in narrow places, like tunnels. One funny thing is that none of those ancestors breath fire, or anything else. Of course, we are only guessing how those characters can be useful, based on what we know on species we know. Okay, so what do we do now? Well, I've heard there was a dragon race planned in 10 minutes. We could see that. We should think about going back home, shouldn't we? That's more like it. Wowzer, you are blowing it! Wait, Wait what? Guys, are you there?